miracle worker, promise keeper, life. Way maker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness, my God.
to you. In Jesus' name, amen. I once was lost in sin, but Jesus took me in. Yes, and then a little light from heaven filled my, my soul, my soul, it bathed my heart, and yeah, and wrote my name up. You know that just a little talk with Jesus makes me well. Now let us have a little talk with 
with Jesus. Let us tell him all about how he will heal. Oh, he will answer. Now when you feel a little prayerful, as your heart to heaven is, I know you'll find a talk with the master makes it Sometimes my path seems dreary without a ray of a well, and then a cloud of doubt may hide the light of day. You know the midst of sin may rise and hide the star in. Oh, but just a little talk with Jesus clears the way. Now let us have a little talk with Jesus. Come on, let us tell him all about how he will hear. I know he will answer. Now when you feel a breath for him, his old heart and heaven is up. I know you will find a little talk with Jesus. Makes it all all right. Well, and I may have doubts and fears my be filled with them. Yes, but Jesus is a friend who watches day and night. I go to him and I'm, I'm glad he knows my every care. You know, and just a talk with Jesus makes it all all right, all right. Now let us come on and let us tell him all about Come on, God, he will hear. I know he will answer by and Now when you feel as your heart to heaven I know you will find Talk with the master, mix it up All right Without you, Lord, without you, Lord, no, I can't make it, take it without you, Lord, take it without you, Lord, oh, without you, Lord, no, no, I can't make it, take it without you. We love you. 
Father, we pray for the sick and shut in, not just here at the North Side congregation, but all over the world. Continue to watch over them and touch their body to be thy will and bring them back to their normal walks of life. We pray for Brother Mayberry as he come forward this morning to preach thy word. We pray that the things that he preached will be able to retain something from it and go out and share with the world. Dear Father, we Pray for love, peace, and joy and happiness throughout this world. Let thy light shine upon all mankind. And dear Father, we, as we go into the fullness, so we pray that the things that we see, do, and say will be to your approval. In Jesus' name I pray. Let us please turn our hymn books to 877, number 877. When with the Savior we'll enter the glory land, won't it be wonderful there? Ended the troubles and cares of the story land, won't it be wonderful there? Won't it be wonderful there? Having no burdens to bear, joyously singing with heart bells all ringing. Oh, won't it be wonderful there? Walking and talking okay. with Christ the supernal, won't it be wonderful there? 
praising, adoring the matchless eternal one. Won't it be wonderful there? Won't it be wonderful there? Having no burdens to bear. Joyously singing with heart bells all ringing. Oh, won't it be wonderful there? There where the tempest will never be sweeping up. Won't it be wonderful there? Sure that forever the Lord will be keeping us. Won't it be wonderful there? Won't it be wonderful there? Having no burdens to bear. Joyously singing with heart bells all ringing. Oh, won't it be wonderful there? Amen. Let us turn our hymn books to page 882. 882. No tears in heaven, no sorrows given, all will be glory in that land. There'll be no sadness, all will be gladness, when we shall join that happy band. No tears. No tears, no tears up there. Sorrow and pain will all have flown. No tears, no tears, no tears up there. No tears in heaven will be flown. Glory is waiting. Waiting up yonder, where we shall spend an endless day. There with our Savior, we'll be forever, where no more sorrows can dismay. No tears, no tears, no tears up there. Sorrow and pain will all have flown. No tears, no tears, no tears up there. No tears in heaven will be known. Some morning yonder will cease to ponder all things this life has brought to view. All will be clearer, say one be dearer in heaven where all will be made new. No tears, no tears, no tears up there. Sorrow and pain will all have flown. No tears, no tears, no tears up there. No tears in heaven will be known. Trouble in my way, trouble in my way. Have to cry sometimes.
again on this side of the timeline of life that for whatever reason he chose to do it God has blessed us he has showered us with his love and his mercy and his grace and if you ever want evidence of that fact just consider that for at least one more time you are among the land of the living and you are being seen and not being viewed those who are visiting with us today, whether you're in our digital worship space or here in the physical location, we want to extend to you a warm welcome. We're so glad that you've come to be with us this morning at the Church of Christ at Northside, and we do consider you as our honored guest. It is our prayer today that your visit with, be, with us will be strengthening and encouraging and edifying and that you will want to come back and be with us because you have benefited by being here today. We extend to you an open invitation to all of our activities here at Northside. And wherever you find yourself able and available, just come on back and be with us as soon and as often as you can. I just want to take a moment this morning to... I uh, wish all of our mothers, our grandmothers, our aunts, our mother figures a happy Mother's Day. 
I believe that uh, if you're a successful man, if you're a anything man, I'm going to say it like that, there is uh, somewhere in the scene uh, a woman who is supporting you and backing you and praying for you and all of those things that you need. So we just want to wish them the best of Mother's Days today. And, and fellas, like I always say, take care of them, especially today. You ain't got to go home and cook. Take them out, though. And show them that you do appreciate them. I'm going to ask this morning that you will join me at the seventh chapter of the gospel account as recorded by Mark. Mark, the seventh chapter. And please join me this morning at verse 24. And we'll be reading through verse 30. Mark 7. Beginning at verse 24 and reading through verse 30. Here the Bible says, And from thence he arose and went into the borders of Tyre and Sidon and entered into a house and would have no man know it, but he could not be hid. For a certain woman, whose young daughter had an unclean spirit, heard of him and came and fell at his feet. The woman was a Greek, a Syrophoenician by nation, and she besought him that he would cast forth the devil out of her daughter. But Jesus said unto her, Let the children first be filled. For it is not meet to take the children's bread and to cast it into the dogs. And she answered and said unto him, Yes, Lord. Yet the dogs under the table eat of the children's crumbs. And he said to her, For this saying, Go thy way. The devil is gone out of thy daughter. And when she was come to her house, she found the devil gone out and her daughter laid upon the bed. The Oscar-winning actress Sally Field once starred in a movie entitled Not Without My Daughter. It was the real life story of a woman by the name of Betty Mahmoudi. She was an American woman who went to the Middle East with her daughter and her Middle Eastern-born husband. And it was intended to be just a family vacation where her husband visits his family living in the political climate of Iran. But Betty discovers once upon getting there that her husband never intended to bring his family back to America. She's become a stranger in a foreign land, forced to live in a society where the women are subservient, abused, and oppressed. Her husband and the Iranian government tell her that she may return to the United States. However, her daughter must stay behind. And without hesitation, Betty Mahmoudi decides that she will not leave without her daughter. 
even if it means her death. She is willing to face humiliation and break down cultural barriers in order to get her child back to safety. Betty Mahmoudi typifies what I want to call this morning a whatever mother. Now, now we, we use this term in, in, in our vernacular quite often, but typically we use it as a term of derision. It's basically when you're in a discussion with somebody and you don't want to hear any more of what they've got to say. So you say, whatever. But I want to use this term this morning as a, a badge of faith and a badge of honor. Because just like Betty Mahmoudi, there are women who will do whatever it takes for their child to be all right. There are women who will go through the fire with gasoline draws on to make sure that everything's cool with their children. And this morning in our text, we find just one of those women. And we want to look at her seeking to get her child back to safety as we deal with the idea or the subject, whatever for my child. Bible tells us here in, in verse 24 that Jesus went into the borders or the coast of Tyre and Sidon. And he went to a house and, and wanted it to be a secret. Bible says, and would have no man know it. Jesus has just uh, finished a preaching campaign. And he wants to rest. But it's interesting, the Bible says about that scene, but he could not be hid. I think it's interesting that even though the Lord of Lords and the King of Kings wanted his visit to this particular house to be secret, Bible says that he could not be hid. Why is that? Well, there are some folk that he's been preaching to. There are some folk who he has been healing. There are some folk who he has been delivering who could not keep it quiet. Let me say that again. There are some folk who he has been preaching to. There are some folk he has been healing. There are some folk who he has delivered who could not keep it quiet. Let me say this for me. This one's free. If you've experienced Jesus, you ought not be able to shut up about it. If you've truly experienced what, what the Lord can do for you, you just got to tell somebody. You just got to make it known what Jesus has done for you, what difference Jesus has made in your life. If you really experience Jesus, you can't hide it. it, it it's interesting sometimes. Uh, uh, sometimes uh, we'll be somewhere, me and my wife, and it becomes evident that I'm not really feeling this place or this activity or these people. And the first time she said that to me, I asked, well, well how do you know? I ain't said nothing. She said, you can't hide nothing because your face your expressions show it all. And that's true. 
we, even though we don't open our mouths, we show what we really think. But I'm going to say this this morning. If you've experienced Jesus, you ought to be showing it with your mouth and your life. Other folk need what you've got. Other folk can benefit simply because you're willing to tell somebody about what you've experienced. And what happened here in this situation? Because folk could not hide their encounters with Jesus. The Bible says this in verse 25, for a certain woman, whose young daughter had an unclean spirit, heard of him and came and fell at his feet. Now, I'm going to take you to Bible class for a moment. In the Bible, typically, when you see somebody who's mentioned by name, the Bible wants you to know particularly about that person. The Bible is going to fill you in or inform you on that personage. But when the Bible introduces you to somebody and never mentions their name, like in this case it says a certain woman, the woman here is not important per se, but it's going to introduce you to something about that person. There's a characteristic, there's a trait that's going to become evident. And that the, 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 the Holy Spirit doesn't want the person to get in the way of the lesson. So here the Bible doesn't even tell us who this person is. It just says a certain woman. But there are some things about this woman that we're briefly introduced to. The Bible lets us know that she has a young daughter who's possessed by an unclean spirit. Now, first thing I want you to see about this woman is this. She was willing to go the extra mile, whatever distance she had to go through, to save her child. Well, 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 how do you know this? Jesus was already where she was. This is how I know it. See, when I say distance, I'm not always talking about physical traveling distance. There are other distances that have to be crossed sometimes in order to get what's needed. Mark informs us, first of all, that this woman is a Syrophoenician, a Greek, who was from Tyre, which was a small island off the coast of the land of Sidon. Matthew, in his account, in Matthew 15 and verse 22, calls her a woman of Canaan or a Canaanite. And both of these writers, Mark and Matthew, are trying to point out that this woman is different culturally and socially and racially. Her situation is different from those folk who were typically uh, led to follow Jesus. See, to the Jews, she was considered a pagan, a heathen. And this woman would have known of the long-standing prejudice between the Jews and anybody else. But catch this this morning. Prejudice and racism did not stop her from seeking help from somebody who might be considered her enemy. When you know your house is burning down, you don't care if the firefighter is a member of the clan. 
You just want that firefighter to come and put out your house. When you go to the doctor for an emergency, you don't sit there and ask, are you a Democrat or a Republican? I want to know, are you a doctor who can fix what's wrong with me? I don't care who you voted for. She knew that when she came into the presence of Jesus, some of them Jews was going to look at her funny and talk about her. Y'all know what it's like. I believe somebody in this room right now knows what it's like to go to parents' night and hear folks murmuring, that's Jimmy's mama. And they ain't saying it in a good way. Some of y'all know that y'all's telephone number is no longer in the parents' directory. Because you Jimmy's mama. This woman had a problem going on in her home with her child. Her child was possessed by a demon, which meant that that child was out of control, off the chains. And she was in crisis. And it's obvious to me that in order for her to seek help outside of her culture and outside of her race and outside of her religion, she was desperate for a solution. See, this woman realized in order to save her child, she had to rearrange her schedule. She had to reorganize her priorities. Whether she wanted to or not, she had to take a day off of work and seek Jesus out. She had to go some extra distance to get help from God. You see, many of us, we want help from the Lord, but we're not willing to go out of our way to get it. We're not willing to make time or to take time for Jesus. But this woman who is in our text needed some help with her child. So if she had to leave early from work to make a session with the Lord, she did it. If she had to cancel her only night out with the girls, she did it. If she had to lose a few dollars at work and not be able to pay the rent, she did it. Because she came to the conclusion, whatever for my child. She's a desperate mother who's seeking Jesus. And I just want to say this this morning. In today's society, there are many folk like this woman who are still seeking out Jesus. I believe that there's a great spiritual thirst in the land. More people are seeking after God than before. And it matters not what the sign says out on the front of the building. They want Jesus. They're seekers after Christ. And they're willing to go where they got to go to get uh, help from Jesus. When you, 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 you need help, you're no longer... Uh, 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 driven by the aesthetic beauty of the building. When you really need help from Jesus, you're not threatened by somebody's dogma or even their doctrine. When you really need help from Jesus, you don't care whether the preacher has a hoop or the choir has a sway. Seekers want Jesus. They're looking for answers on how to deal with the addictions and the habits and the problems that they've got. They want to know how to mend their broken homes and raise that difficult child. This woman here was seeking relief. Her daughter was ill and she was willing to do whatever it took to save her baby. Something had possession of her little girl. 
and truth be told, many of us have had children in that same position. We might not want to admit it because we want everybody to look at us and think we were the perfect parent. But many of us have had children in that position. What once was a beautiful young child is now acting like an ugly and arrogant animal. Something is taken over them. Some are possessed with vanity and pride. They, they, they obsess over their appearance. Every week the nails have to be done. They have to be in designer clothes. Their hair must be on lay. Skipping meals and building up their muscles. Closets have to be filled with the latest designer clothes. Others have been possessed by greed because they've got to have everything that comes out. They can't survive without the new PlayStation. They have to have the latest iPhone to talk to their friends. Some of them are possessed by rebelliousness and anger. And you know it because Saturday morning chore time has turned into a public display of injustices that take place at your address. You often find yourself being like a strike negotiator. And just like this woman in the text, if we're honest with ourselves, sometimes we need help too. And I can imagine this woman seeking the help she needs trying to get some help. She took her daughter for therapy and got a prescription for Prozac. That didn't help. She took her out of public school and put her in private school. And they tested her and put her in special ed. Frustrated days, she probably sent her daughter to be with uh, the grandparents. But she learned that her daughter would skip out on them and meet up with some boy in the neighborhood. And it would seem that no matter what she did, nothing could save her daughter from this self-destructive cycle. What we have to realize, that no matter how hard we try to secure a future for our child, we somewhat are powerless. We can only pray that God would keep them safe. So when we go on in the story in verse 25, the Bible lets us know that this woman who had this child who was possessed came and prostrated herself at Jesus' feet. I want to ask a question this morning. Why is it that most of the time we find ourselves in problem. The spiritual realm is the last place we look to for help. We'll try any and everything else when our back is up against the wall. Don't believe it? You don't want to say nothing when your child is going through all kind of hell. But when you find that child has been locked up, that child has been locked up, why you call the preacher? Because you tried everything else instead of looking for spiritual help. Church is asked to pray after the pregnancy test comes back positive. Instead of trying to get some help before it, when you know your child is out there off the chains. You want to get God involved after we find the white powder in the room. We wouldn't say nothing in the spiritual realm when we knew something was going on. This woman has reached the end of her rope. And she realizes 
that whatever I'm doing ain't making nothing better. So she comes to Jesus, the Bible says, and she causes a disturbance. Whoa, 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 whoa. Bro, preacher, where you see that at? That ain't Mark didn't say nothing about a disturbance. Go look at Matthew's account of the same incident over in Matthew chapter 15. Matthew 15. And I want you to take a look specifically, starting at verse number 22. Matthew 15. And verse number 22. Watch what the Bible says here. And behold, the woman of Canaan came out of the same coast and cried unto him, saying, Have mercy on me, O Lord, thy son of David. My daughter is grievously vexed with the devil. But he answered her not a word. Watch this. And his disciples came and besought him, saying, Send her away, for she crieth after us. It's funny what we see in this text here. And I'm going to change the name of some of these folk real quick. I'm not going to call them his disciples. I'm going to call them this morning good old church folk. This woman comes to Jesus for help. And good old church folk Tell Jesus, send her away, for she crieth after us. First of all, here are some folk who see this woman in a desperate situation. Come to Jesus for help. And they're upset because this woman is upsetting their flow. Lady, can't you shut up for a moment? Don't you see we having church service up in here? You come in here with all of this noise and, and, and disturbing Jesus. Why don't you go back there and sit down until service is over? Then, then, then we might talk to you. But then we see how narcissistic they are, these church folk. Send her away, for she crieth after us. Now, I want you to take a real close look at this cry made by this woman. Have mercy on me. O Lord, thou son of David, have mercy on me, O Lord, thou son of David. Third time's a charm. Have mercy on me, O Lord, thou son of David. Where do you see us in there? My Bible says she cried after Jesus. But the disciples made it all about them. Ain't that just like good old church folk? It's all about them. It's not why are you disturbing Jesus. It's why are you disturbing us. They want to get rid of her because she's disturbing and upsetting the scheduled program. Let me tell you something about folk who are in trouble, who know nothing about your procedures and your protocol, and who know little about your customs and rituals. Here it is. They don't care. All they know is I got to get to Jesus. And the interesting thing is those of us who claim to know Jesus ought to be trying to help her get to Jesus. 
instead of saying, why are you disturbing us? If I'm really trying to get to Jesus, what you talking about that ain't important, I don't care. I need to see Jesus. And if I got to disrupt your scheduled program, guess what? Jesus don't mind. And I don't care. And we got to deal with the reality that when folk need Jesus desperately, they don't care about your protocol. And you ought to be willing to drop your protocol at that moment. We so stuck on protocol sometimes that we'll throw the baby out with the bath water. and think we've done something. That's the perspective of somebody who needs Jesus. All they realize is that God can do something for them. So they may come in causing a disturbance. They may show up with body piercings and booty shorts on. Guess what? So what? They may show up smelling like weed. Guess what? So what? They may show up with a little profanity coming out of their mouths. Guess what? So what? All they know is I need Jesus, and your protocols is the last thing on my mind. Bible says she comes in the door. She falls out on the floor crying, Jesus, have mercy on my child. And that brings us to the second point. Here's a woman who is willing to humble herself before God. Look at verse 27 again. Bible says that she begs for help. And initially it seems that Jesus says no. It seems that our Lord and Savior has denied a prayer request on the basis of somebody's identity. Look again at what he said in verse number 27, Mark chapter 7. The Bible says this, let the children first be filled. For it is not meet to take the children's bread and to cast it to the dogs. Let me say that again. Let the children first be filled. For it is not meat or it is not right to take the children's bread and cast it to the dogs. Jesus here indirectly refers to this woman as a dog. Now, 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 before you get your tail feathers all twisted, I need you to think for a moment. Jesus begins to go to the root of the problem. He begins to address a problem that existed for generations. And the problem was this. You see, the Jews traditionally regarded the Gentiles as dogs. In fact, the Greeks even, in their cultured selves, called shameless women dogs. <coughs> it was the ultimate insult. It was the same horrible connotation today when somebody calls a woman the B word. Because you know when they use that word, all they're saying is you're a female dog. You see, to be called a dog in that culture 
was to be compared to the sway dogs who traveled in packs in ancient Palestine. They had no one to care for their needs, so they had to fend for themselves. And they were the scavengers of the street. They were diseased, they were dirty, always nosing around the garbage looking for something to eat. You recall your scripture, you know it was the dogs in the street who disposed of Jezebel's body. If you know anything about scripture, you know it was dogs who licked the wounds of Lazarus as he sat outside the rich man's house, waiting to eat table scraps from his table. Dogs were usually reviewed with contempt. But Jesus had referred to this woman as a dog, and that's a term that seems a little harsh coming from our Lord. But I believe that Jesus knows and Jesus understands that people who've been living a rough life often tend to lose their sense of humanity. And we see them doing things. Uh, and we might not outwardly call folk like this dogs, but we have come up with names for them. We call them things like crackheads and prostitutes, idiots, pedophiles, hootlums, thugs. You've heard those terms. And that's what we tend to call folk who, who, who had to deal with uh, systems like this woman dealt with. But I need to take you here for a moment. Jesus called this woman in, who was in need a dog. But I need you to understand there were different words for dogs in the Greek language and in the Hebrew language. When Jesus called, said dog, he was not referring to these wild, untamed, unrestrained dogs. Jesus was, was referring to uh, uh, or using the term that referred to our household pets. Now, now, those of you who have pets, you love that pet, don't you? That little dog, that little cat, whatever it is you got. You take care of that animal. You feed that animal. You hug that animal. You do all that kind of stuff. And although pets are loved in your family, your children take priority over your pets. Because if you are low on money and you got to feed something, you're going to feed your children before you feed your cat. I hope you are. If not, we got to talk. Jesus simply is telling her that there is a hierarchy at this time in his ministry. And the needs of his people was the first priority. But the truth of the matter goes even deeper than that. See, Jesus is testing her desperation. He's seeing if she's willing to lose her identity to get what she needs. See, see, see there's also something about folk who, 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 who are lost in looking. Sometimes they think that they're better than those hypocritical church folks as well. See, see we all got some work to do. See, we'll come to the family table of God seeking a word, seeking help, but, but refuse to acknowledge his family. I'm going to tell you something. If you come to my house looking for some help from me and, and you won't even say hi to my family who there, we got a problem. If you're willing to accept me and what I got, but turn your nose up at my wife and my children, we got a problem. And how is it that we think we can come to Jesus and not acknowledge his people? 
his system, his way. Jesus is simply letting this woman and everybody else know his people have first priority. And you know how that works in your own life. I love all y'all. But to be honest, if it's a choice of feeding you or feeding my wife, guess who gets fed? If it's a choice of clothing you or clothing my children, guess who gets clothed? And don't look at me funny because you're the same way. You ought to be. Because God gave them to me as my first ministry. And he gave you what he gave you as your first ministry. They come first. Jesus is saying the same thing. My first ministry was to come to deal with the Jews. And it's not right for me to give you what belongs rightly to them. Jesus is saying, woman, you're not the priority right now. He tells this woman, let me first feed the children of promise who need my help. Wait until they are filled. Wait until they have been healed. Wait till they have been blessed. Wait till they've been given the spirit. But I love this woman's tenacity. Look at what she says. Verse number 28. She answered and said unto him, yes, Lord. Yet the dogs under the table eat from the children's crumbs. Although I realize, Jesus, that they are to eat first, even the little puppies can get scraps that fall from the table without disturbing the meal. You don't have to interrupt the meal plans, Jesus. Just let me get the stuff that falls from the table. And look at what Jesus does. Jesus rewards this woman for her knowing. Jesus doesn't play it like some of us good church folk do. She gets a blessing from the master's table right away because of her tenacity. Jesus doesn't say, well, I said what I said, and I go sit in the back and wait. Jesus doesn't say, well, come back tomorrow because we ain't got time for you right now. We're doing something else. Jesus takes care of her need right then. You know how I know it? Look at what he said at verse number 29 when when she made her statement. The Bible says, and he said unto her, for this saying, go thy way. The devil is gone out of their daughter. Notice that. He didn't say the devil will go out of their daughter. The devil is gone, present tense. That meant that as he said it, it happened. Immediately, right then at the moment, she got what she needed. She wasn't too proud to beg. She wasn't too stubborn to grovel. She didn't come thinking that Jesus had to do it her way. She asked Jesus for what she needs simply. And Jesus responded. And I don't know about you this morning, but it's good to know that if you will just cry out to God for help, God will always answer. If you're willing to call upon God, he will be there. And he will serve you if you're helpless in the face of social and physical and psychological and emotional and, yes, even religious opposition. No prejudice in his compassion. 
His love for humanity is colorblind. He doesn't look at your political sway. He don't care if, like the song says, red or yellow, black or white. What he did see, however, in this woman was some faith. And that's the last point, and we're just about done with this thing this morning. If you're going to be a whatever type of parent for your child, you got to have faith. I can't say that enough. If you're going to be a whatever type of parent for your child. I'm speaking to the fathers too. I know this is Mother's Day. But fathers, you included in this as well. You have got to have faith. What good is it going to Jesus for some help if you don't really believe that he can do what needs to be done? I'd be a fool. If I woke up tomorrow feeling sick and went to the doctor, went to the ER or whatever, and sat there in the face of the doctor and said, I, I got this problem, but I really don't think you can deal with it. Why did I go in the first place? I went because I had some faith that they could find out and do something for what I was dealing with. You notice I was sick and I went to the doctor. I didn't go to the mechanic. Why? Because I didn't have faith in that mechanic can do something with my body that needed to be done. That doctor, I believe, however, could. And that's the same kind of faith we got, got to have in Jesus if we're going to expect Jesus to do something for us. We got to have faith that he can do what needs to be done. He saw humility in her faith. He saw that she had an active faith. In other words, she put her faith into action. You see, a lot of times we'll say we have faith and we'll sit on our hands for years and not do a thing. This woman had a faith that caused her to go out and put herself in a position she knew could be humiliating. She knew she could possibly get turned down. She knew folk were looking at her funny. But we'll sit up and, and, and need help and say, uh, I'm not going to go over there because them folk going to look funny at me. They're going to talk about me. I don't care. If I need Jesus, I'm going to seek Jesus out, and I don't care what you say about it. I don't care about what you whisper behind my back. I don't care how funny you look at me. Because if you're going to have faith in him, it has to be an active faith. You have to seek him out. Here's a woman who had a whatever type of faith, who was willing to do whatever it took to get help for her child. And just like it was true 2,000 years ago at this situation, it's still the same today. The same Jesus who took care of her needs can take care of whatever your needs are right now especially in the realm of you trying to do what it takes for your children. And whether you want to believe it or not, whether you accept it or not, whether you want to try to put caveats on it or not, your children need you to have that type of whatever faith. They need you to have that whatever attitude. That I'm going to do whatever it takes for the betterment of my children. I'm going to do whatever I've got to do. My faith has to lead me to whatever it takes. But I'm also going to say that faith is going to just lead you to one place. The same place that led this woman to the feet of Jesus. You don't
don't have to be a rocket scientist to realize that all of the things that society has tried in place of Jesus don't work. The medications, the illicit medications, the promiscuities, trying to make ourselves feel good. The shopping, the retail therapy that we get into when we get a, have a problem. None of that solves the problem. Yeah, it might make you feel good for a moment. But guess what? Drugs wear off. Alcohol wears off. Promiscuity is just going to lead you to the next big thing. Inflation will blow up your retail therapy. And what you bought today is going to be outdated next month anyway. The only thing that you can count on, the only thing that you ought to be putting your faith and your hope and your trustee is Jesus. And the good thing about Jesus is he doesn't turn anybody down. Look at what he said at the end of Matthew ch chapter 11. Come to me all who labor and are heavy laden and I will give you rest. All, not some, not this particular group, not all of you who get the protocols and, 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 and the procedures, right? All who labor and are heavy laden, I got something for you. And just as he said it in Matthew 11, it still stands true today. If you are just willing to come to him, whatever the problems are, I can make this guarantee that Jesus is the solution. I don't care what you've tried in the past. Jesus is the solution. You ought to try him. And you can try him right now. Whatever your issue is, lay it at his feet. And if you just have faith, watch him take care of what you thought couldn't be taken care of. Watch him do what you thought couldn't be done. Watch him handle who you thought couldn't be handled. But you got to have faith enough to come to him and lay it at his feet. Maybe you're not a child of God this morning. Again, just like I said a few moments ago, the children are the first priority. I like the way American Express used to say it. Membership has its privileges. Y'all know what that means. Again, I love each and every child in this room. But that one sitting in the back takes priority. Why? Because membership has its privileges. He's a member of my family. Sisters, I love each and every one of you. But if you think you're coming before my wife, you got another thought coming. Why? because membership has its privileges. And there are privileges that children of God enjoy that nobody else does. And if you want to enjoy the privileges of a relationship with God, you first of all have to be a member of his family. 
How do I become a member of his family? I'm glad you asked. Understand something. There was, and for some of you, is a time when you're separated from God. Isaiah 59 and 2 makes this very plain. There's a gulf between where God is right now and where you are right now. And what made the gulf? God didn't run away from you. Isaiah 59 and 2 says, your sin has separated you from your God. In other words, it's what we did that caused the distance. We turned our backs. We walked away. But God wanted the gulf to be bridged. God wanted a way for you to get back to him. So he had to, first of all, take care of that issue of sin. And he did it through Christ. John 3.16 tells us so plainly, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever shall believe in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. And God did this while you were still in sin. Paul tells us in Romans 5, 8, for God commended or showed his love toward us, and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. God wanted you saved. God wanted you reconciled back to him. And he made it happen by sacrificing his son as a propitiation for your sins. Don't let that big word propitiation scare you. It just means he sacrificed in place of you. Because your sins were supposed to lead to your death. But God said, no, 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 I'm going to let him die in your place. His death will satisfy your sin problem. That's the knowledge you need to have. What do I need to do with that knowledge? First of all, you need to believe it. You need to have faith in what I just told you is true. Hebrews 11 and 6 tells us without faith it is impossible to please God. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is and that he's the rewarder of them that diligently seek him. In other words, if you're looking for God, God will make sure you find him. Secondly, let that belief lead you to repentance. Here's your part. That sin that Christ came and died for for you, you turn away from it. You repent of it. You turn your back to it. You go in a different direction now. And that direction is toward Christ. Thirdly, you confess. And that just doesn't mean that you verbalize something with your mouth. That word literally means that you stand in agreement with God on this. That Jesus is the Christ and that he's God's son. And you're baptized, fourthly, for the remission of your sins. And understand this, Jesus doesn't care how big your sins were and how many they were. Because that's all a foolish thought anyway. Sin is sin. So don't let nobody make you think that because I've sinned big, God can't do nothing with it. Big sin and little sin is crazy. That's just like being a lot pregnant and a little pregnant. It don't work that way. Either you pregnant or you not. Either you sin or you haven't. And 
if you've sinned, you need to be washed. You need to be cleansed. And baptism does that as it brings you in contact with his shed blood. You arise from that water a new creature. And living right and faithful till you die one day, eternity with God will be yours. The question I want to ask you this morning is simply this. What's your decision? What's your desire? Make it known. If you're in our digital worship space this morning, just reach out using the information that appears on your screen, whether it's the phone number, whether it's the email address, and we'll reach right back out to you and facilitate what needs to be done. If you're here in our, digital, in our, our physical location, just come forward and let us know what's needed, and we'll make it happen immediately. The question again, what's your decision? Make it a decision for Christ as we stand and as we sing the Lord's song of invitation right now. Won't you come to Jesus Christ? There are some things I may not know.
authority is over us. Oh, I heard him say that to my heart of eyes, I bloody heart. Oh, oh, tell him, sing along. Lord, I to the yes. I don't you know that I, I am so wondrous and less saved from sin. It's because you. So, so sweet, a little bit with it. And it was there at the cross, y'all, where he, he took me, he took me in. And don't you know I cried, glory, glory to him. Oh, now help me sing, glory, glory to him. What a wonderful name, y'all. Oh, what a precious name, Lord. Glory to God. His precious name. And I heard him say, yeah. Oh, what's that let y'all up like somebody say, Lord. Glory to God. Oh, just so one more time, glory, 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 glory to his, what a wonderful name, y'all, oh, what a precious name, glory, glory, glory to his, yeah, Lord, and then I heard somebody say there, right there, what was that blood, y'all, up like, then somebody said, glory, glory, glory to you, yes. I got to say it again, I, I am so wondrous. And as they were eating, Jesus took bread and blessed it and break it and gave it to the disciples and said, take eat, this is my body. And he took the cup, gave thanks. Gave them saying, Drink ye all of it. For this is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. But I say unto you, I will not drink henceforth this fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we are thankful for thy son's sacrifice upon the cruel cross of Calvary. While we ask as we take these emblems, which represents your son's broken body and shed blood. And may we do so with clean hands and a pure heart. In Jesus Christ's name, we ask it all. Amen. Let us also remember the words of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, where it is more blessed to give than to receive. And in so giving, there are several options here at the Northside Congregation, such as bank pay, cash app, and PayPal. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we are thankful for the many blessings that thou hast bestowed upon us. Father, as we give back a small portion of these many blessings, we hope they are used, pleasing, and acceptable unto thee. In Jesus Christ's name we ask it all. Amen.